So a little bit about as you build your teams and you look to move towards the DevOps model, um, how do you, you know, what, what do you need to look for when you're staffing a team? And how, you know, how, like going back to that, what sort of percentage of your team should be focused on DevOps uh, or, uh, oriented activities versus app development? And, and what sort of personality types and or skill sets lend themselves uh, to this kind of work? Because it, it definitely, um, there are certain some hard there are certain some hard skills that need to be there in terms of technical expertise, um, but then then there's a set of things that aren't necessarily technical, but people who do well at DevOps uh, tend to have these characteristics. So just some observations that I've seen from working in DevOps for a few years. Um, skill sets. So a lot of these uh, are are really you know pure requirements. Uh, somebody who's not comfortable in Unix at the Unix command line is probably going to need some time before they can operate in a DevOps model. Um, it's, just, it's just basic table stakes for this kind of work. You have to, you have to know uh, and, be, and be adept at, at knowing how to look at processes, knowing where standard things go. Um, you know, it's, it's at the end of the day, when you're troubleshooting something in production, um, it's likely that you're going to have to go out to a command line and, and, and try to you know, figure out what's going on at the, at the system level. Um, the other thing I would say is that oftentimes when you're facing a problem in the wild, there's, there's generally not a neon sign uh, that's pointing directly at your problem saying, it's right here, dummy, go fix this. So, um, so one thing I would say is that you, 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 need to, you need to be able to look at a big picture and be able to narrow in pretty quickly. Um, and and, and you know, certain people are just better at that than others. Uh, and sometimes it takes actually being in a tough spot to, to know who, your, who, who on your team is, is really good at that and, and who, who struggles with it. Um, we talked about logging being really important and logging being a way that um, we get a lot of information about our systems. Uh, people that are good at sifting through large sets of data and coming up with ways of uh, visualizing that data um, are very, you know, tend to be very good at DevOps uh, type activities. Um, we talked about testing quite a bit. I think this goes without saying. I think no, no matter what kind of engineer you have on your team, uh, you, you're going to want people that appreciate testing, who don't think of testing as extra work, who think of testing as a regular part of their daily activities. Um, another thing that's it's, it's true about almost all engineering is that you can't just focus and be an expert at Java or be an expert at JavaScript. Um, these systems are really complicated and deploying things and monitoring them oftentimes means you're going to be dealing with a wide range of languages and technologies. And the more flexible, the more willing you are to learn Ansible or to learn the differences between um, Kubernetes and VM deployments and, and to, to continue to expand the set of things you can work with, the more successful you're going to be. And this applies to DevOps as well. It's probably even more so here because you're typically going to be Constantly asking yourself, what's the right tool for this job? You know, I might be most comfortable with Java, but um, we just had a conversation over here where uh, somebody from Target who works on a platform team, they do a lot of programming in Go for, for a variety of reasons. And, and if you're using the right tool for the job, and if you, uh, you're going you're gonna to be more efficient, you're going to be more effective, um, DevOps probably presents more of a... Of a, of a opportunity to leverage this because you're doing so many different things that you constantly have to ask yourself, what should I be writing this code in and, and, and why? Um, and lastly, you know, uh, pure operations people are becoming about as rare as pure API or application development people. You need people that, th you need people that are doing operations that can think like a developer, that can solve problems like a developer, that can, um, you know, Check in code, give feedback, you know, do all the standard types of development activities. They're just focused on a different type of different set of code. Um, what am I missing here? I know I'm missing things. So give me give me some ideas of, of other things from a you know kind of technical skill set perspective that you look for or that you have as a DevOps person that 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 is extremely valuable and, and important in this in this area. Hey, I, I'm let me, let me just summarize. Let me try to summarize. I think what he said was like, this slide is terrible. I think that, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and, I, and I appreciate hearing that. I, I think that um, if, you know, 
So I, I, I like hearing the perspective. I'm glad you shared it. I, I think I'm not communicating effectively if I'm trying to describe it as a noun and not a verb. What, what, when I put together this list, I think about it from the mindset of over three years of supporting real live systems that people care about, um, certain characteristics and skill sets have played a key role in making sure that we've been able to keep things running and trying to sort of think through, uh, because sometimes, you know, when you hire an engineer, you know, so I've always, I've always approached uh, bringing people onto the team as let me get the strongest engineers I can, the people that have, you know, a good grounding in computer science and a good troubleshooting and problem solving mentality. Um, and when it comes to dealing with production situations, there's, there's almost this untrained you know, and, and again, com coming from the app development perspective, it, it's, it, it feels magical because it's like some people have this skill and, and they're able to do it better than others. Um, but it, there's probably an element to it where they've learned it somewhere. They've, they've gotten some training to say, like, when you encounter a problem, here's a methodical way of approaching it so that it isn't magical. But, um, but so, so I, you know, I, I, like, I like the discussion. I, 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 I don't feel like I'm as far. I feel like I hear what you're saying, and I agree with what you're saying. So I don't feel like I'm as far off as we say. But I'm, I'm I must be communicating in a way that doesn't yeah, I, doesn't I, highlight that. I, I think we're going to communicate back and forth. All right. So to, to recap what he's saying, and, and as we talk, I'm, I'm you know it's so what, what you were saying was somebody's willingness to learn new things and adapt and and to to pick up things quickly is key. And I and I think the more we talk about this, there really is no difference here between that and what you know, a pro, you know, an API or an application programmer would be um, is that in, in the modern world, the most important thing you can bring to a computing degree is, is, a, is a desire to continually learn. Because the environment is always changing. The requirements are always changing. It's, and it's, it's, it's rapidly evolving. And people that, don't, people that are afraid of picking up new things or intimidated by picking up new things Regardless of whether you call it DevOps or whether, regardless of whether you call it, you know, programming, um, are going to struggle. They're not going to. They're not going to be able to do the kinds of things that they need to do in this kind of dynamic environment. So I, I, I agree with both of those comments. Is that these aren't unique, you know? So there's nothing about this. I would say other than, you know, in my mind, you know, you're going to be ineffective in any kind of DevOps role if until you become proficient at Unix. You know, system stuff like that's something that not necessarily all people that have done programming have experience with. I I I don't see how in, in the in the environments that I've been in. I mean, maybe, maybe there's maybe there's Microsoft-based deployments where you don't need that, but um, being able to navigate and and have you know good knowledge of how Unix systems operate and where things where things are and 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 how to get to them quickly. Um, is an important is an important piece that I've seen in the teams that I've that I've been involved in managing. Um, any other strong reactions? I never thought that this would be like an extremely controversial slide, but thanks for <laughs> mentioning that. Yeah. Yep. So, yep. So I, I can I so I I agree totally. So the, so calm in the face of adversity. So I I'll skip forward to this other slide, which is sort of like not necessarily like pure technical skills, but just sort of like good personality traits and sort of intangible skill sets that make somebody better at it than others. And that's a big one, is that, is that in many cases, these outages, these, these production issues um, can be very b business impactful. And you can have a lot, you can, you can have the weight of the world on your shoulders. The people that can remain calm and look at, look at what's in front of them and get to what the root is quickly um, but, but remaining calm is, is, is paramount. You, you, can't, you can't solve a problem if you're, if you're wrapped up in, in, in how, and how much pressure is being placed on you uh, by the situation. So uh, I, I agree 100%. So yeah, so your point is that you're, you're not likely to find yourself in a situation where you have seven major league players on the team and who can all do everything equally well. And I, that's been my experience too. People tend to gravitate towards liking to do different things and are stronger at certain things than others. When I think of the people that mostly do uh, the DevOps work on my team, um, it's not the it, you know we we sort of we sort of like within the team we're built a little bit like the old school operational and app model is we have you know and it's percentage wise it's that same 25% of the team is focused on 
building platform stuff. And, and they're not the only ones that are supporting the system. So we're not saying, hey, platform systems engineers, you're the only ones that are on call. It's those people are responsible for building a platform that's maintainable by the entire team. We're going to distribute the support um, responsibility to everybody so that we're not all taking call you know, every single day of our lives. They have to, so their main job, what I've told them is, your main job is to enable the rest of this team to deploy and support the system. And so they have to be good at doing the system's work, but then they also have to be good at, we have weekly one hour training sessions where they teach us how to use you know, Grafana you know, uh, successfully, how they teach us how to use uh, Spinnaker uh, to scale up, scale down. They so they are, they are responsible for building out that platform. Um, you know, if, we had, if we had eight people that could do it all equally well, it would be very fluid. I haven't seen that situation yet. I think full stack is really interesting, but um, the more you know, there is there is a place for specialization here, and that specialization is make the platform as maintainable and supportable as you can. Um, you know, but focus on doing that and focus on building uh, API code that's as responsive and fast, and you know, and you know, and certainly you know, be aware of these various parts, but people have specific areas that they're responsible for. So it's not like, I, I don't think there's a magic wand that will make everybody equally good at everything and equally, and, and will equally want to work on everything at the same time. So um, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, so the, the, yeah, the question is, what, what are you finding and what, you know, what, what people are you starting with and getting them trained up on the areas that they need most? Um, I would say that, uh, it, it, it's, it's a mix, but I would say it's less. So, so when I think of like, uh, when you describe like a network specialist, um, we haven't really taken somebody who's really focused on hardcore networking and set up, setting up large networks and just being focused just on the networking side. We haven't really gotten anybody like that and successfully onboarded them onto our team. Most of the people have had a background of either, you know, Java services development, and then they need to be trained up on what the cloud technologies are, what the, what the uh, you know, operations technologies are. Uh, we've hired a few people who uh, have had primarily operational backgrounds of cloud operations and, and dealing with cloud infrastructure. Um, and they've, they've gotten up to speed on, on building APIs and, and the kinds of challenges we have there. But they, they've mostly stayed within the, within the operational side of building infrastructure for our team. Um, so uh, very, f you know, I, I, what I've seen is that if people have an interest in getting into an area, if that's, the, that's the biggest key to their success, is that if they really want to get into cloud work or they really want to get into supporting scalable services, um, they'll probably be successful at it because they'll, they'll persevere and, and work through it. We've taken people that had very little technical background at all and, and made them productive in this environment. Um, but you have to have that, you have to have that desire. And back to your comment, they have to have a desire to not be intimidated by new things. They sort of have to have an attitude of like, yeah, I can figure this out. And they'll just keep at it until they, until they get it. That's, that's really key for any of these, for any of these roles. But it, it, there, there's, there's, to me, those are, those are the bigger criteria than, than necessarily having a specific set of, uh, set of background. Somebody that really cares um, about whether this thing is functioning or not, that you know, that's that's a huge intangible. Is that somebody when they get the call that they don't say like, ah, oh, you know, whatever. They, they 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 sort of they sort of take it on themselves to, and and this is probably where people who have come from a more traditional programming background, where they're just used to coding for a living during nine to four hours, um, have had to have this change of mindset of like, you know, there are going to be times when I'm going to be called into action that's not going to be during the day and. That's that's not an easy that's not an easy transition. Um, you know we have to be upfront with people when they join the team as to here's what it looks like to be on this team. And if if you don't see yourself wanting to do that kind of work, you know that's not you know that's not you're not going to fit within within our team. So that that's been a mind shift. I know I I know I haven't you know had to deal with that for most of my career. It's only been the last four or five years where I've had to really embrace you know or just accept being on call. It's uh, you know, it's a new, new, new reality for, for me. But I know, from, I know from people coming from an operations back, background, 
It's like, well, welcome to the welcome to the club. That's that's uh, that's been life forever. So, I think that's a great great tagline. Not full stack engineers, full stack teams. That's that's brilliant. That's that's my my experience of success is. Not everybody exhibits every behavior, but as a whole, the team can get out of a pickle itself. Like that's that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I do. I, so I love Agile, but I do feel like that's one of the fallacies of Agile is that it's completely fluid, and anybody should be able to take any story off the top of the backlog. I, I, I that's always rubbed me the wrong way. And when when I've had been on teams that have wanted to work that way, I've been frustrated because. I don't think that that's the. I don't think that reflects the practical realities of skill sets and interests and motivation. You know, at the end of the day, if you're not motivated to work on something, you're going to do a half-assed job with it. And so, you, I want people working on things that they love. And if somebody loves networking, they're going to they're going to do great at that. You know, but within the team, you need to have the skill sets that'll get you uh, get you what get you this. The product needs to live. The product needs to be up, available, operating, and, and going, and, and figure out what you need to do that. It may not, you may not need a network person. You, know, you may not run into that kind of problem where you need to go full stack. Yeah. Risk. Right. Right. So the, the beer truck scenario that you know, somebody's the only person that knows this thing, how do you distribute that? How do you get everybody you know, to at least have a base level of knowledge so that it's not, you're not vulnerable to that? Um, you know, I think that the, 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 more, the more perspective you have, and, and in my mind, this, this program is all about perspective. It's all about, you know, we, we have to be experts in what we do day to day because it's really technically challenging. Everybody in this room fits in that category. And one of the great things about this is on a Friday or a Saturday, you get to come here and you get to hear, you know, some bozo mouth off about what he thinks DevOps means. And that helps inform you about, you know, if not reality, what the perceptions of reality are in our in our in our complex industry. So I think having having those having a broader view of of all the different ways that this industry works and doesn't work um, will help you make better decisions. And I think the people you know what you come away from this program is how do I become a better decision maker about creating systems and about you know solving problems with with software. So. That's what I would say in general about this program is, is give you that broader perspective about all the different possibilities, all the different scenarios that exist out there. Well, you should talk, talk to each other about that for a couple of minutes. Yeah, talk about. <laughs> all right, do it, for, do it for a few minutes, and we'll get some, some ideas. What, what's a good leader, what, what does a good, good, good leader look like to you, and what, what do bad leaders look like to you? Technology leaders. All right. So let's, uh, let's hear what you guys came up with. Who, uh, who wants to share uh, either, either good or bad leadership uh, characteristics or, or potentially learnings that you're going to come out of here with? So good leader. Not technical. <clears throat> it's, this isn't a technical thing at all. You just need to be able to relate and understand people and connect with them and feel like they're, people feel like they, you understand them. Great. What else? Sure. Because most people don't operate at their best levels when they have a gun to their head, right? So responsibility. For, uh, for things that go wrong. Could that be prioritization? So knowing what the top priorities are? Right, and that they include things like <laughs> Yeah, something. So you're saying, you're saying I, am I hearing you say, trust your people to tell you how long things will take? No, no. Empower? I don't have an answer for it. I, I just think it's a thing to do. Well, is, does everyone agree that it's unsolved? I don't necessarily, so, so I guess I have a different opinion here, but um, everyone, everyone thinks that estimating is, is, has not, or that there are not effective ways of estimating, I, that's what I should okay, say. Yeah. yeah. So I think, it's a, I think it's a breaking up the problem exercise. Yes. Yeah. I agree with that. Well, I don't, I don't know that that's an interesting, pro I mean, maybe it's interesting, it's interesting only in that we've been trying to do it for a long time. It's not an effective way. It hasn't been proven to be an effective way to, to run a project, in my, in my opinion, because it's, it's wildly off. It, it feels like we... 
Yeah, so, so you shouldn't blindly trust people, yeah. but you should know the signs of when something is likely to be trustworthy. If, if you told me this was going to take you 15 minutes versus 15 days, I'm more likely to trust the 15 minute estimate. Uh, you know, just, you know, with random, random engineer, I'm more likely to trust the 15 minute estimate than the 15 day estimate because the 15 day estimate can turn into a 15 week estimate or, you know, or worse or never get finished. Um, but yeah, there, there is, there's an aspect of this of how do you, how do you uh, trust the things that you should and question the things that you should. So, yep. So what I'd recap that to say is that, number one, it gives you a perspective on how broad this field is and that it's, <clears throat> it's, it's very vast and there's a lot of different ways of approaching problems and a lot of different problems. The second is you're surrounded by people who are choosing to better themselves and to learn and to expose themselves to new ideas. And those kinds of people are worth learning from. And it's not just about the professors, it's about your classmates, it's about the interactions, it's about being open to other bright, motivated people that are out there looking to improve themselves. And, and collectively, you're all going to get better because of that. That's the experience I've had with this program as well. Yep, having a common goal is, is essential and, and not everybody is effective at that. So I would agree. So, so, what, yeah, so one of the contributing factors uh, she highlighted was that um, the, only, the only advancement appears to be on the management side. Like, you know, companies are trying to create higher levels of, of engineering, but the people at the highest levels of the company are all managers pretty, pretty exclusively. And that's, I'd say, I would say most companies fit into that. And so if somebody wants to succeed in a, in a professional setting, their, their best path for that is on management. And... Um, you know, I think some technical companies have more maturity there, but you know, many non-technical companies don't. They're still trying to get out of this mindset that spending money in IT is a cost center versus how they're going to survive from a business standpoint. So, how many so, the, so even though so this represents a, an engineering-focused list, but it isn't it isn't necessarily what senior management perceives their good leaders are. You know, they they may have a very different view of what a good leader looks like from their perspective. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. It's how do we transform from, how do we get this list in alignment with, with senior management's list of, of good engineering management or good engineering leadership perspective? I think one, one story I can tell is that sometimes it'll have to come from something really bad happening to force the change. But that's, that's one possible avenue is that you have a huge shakeup that forces you to rethink your relationship with technology and technology people so that you listen to them and you value them the way they need to be valued for you to be successful in that space. I don't know if there's other, other, other examples of that or if people have seen different. I, I think where, where DevOps supports that core problem is in that, that the most, one of the most valuable things it affords you is the ability to make small changes, get them out frequently, and get a, a shorter type feedback loop on everything you do. You know, the longer you go from doing some work to when that work gets, sees the light of day and actually is, is in the face of a customer in some way, the more likely that you either did it wrong, didn't think about all the consequences, or have to redo something, it just increases. And, and you know, we're, we're not, as, as, as people, we're not great at predicting the future. Most of us are not great at predicting the future. But if we can attempt to do something that's pretty straightforward and, and a small enough chunk of work. It's, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's how, you know, it, it's been essential to, to computing since the beginning, is break things down into small chunks. We can't, we can't deal with the complexity of an entire system very well and, and get it done uh, serially. We have to take small parts, get it out there, verify that it worked as we expected, and then move on to the next one. Um, that solves the need for estimation because you know, if you can tell me that by the end of the day you can have this one thing out and live in production, we can we can face whatever challenges tomorrow brings. You know, once that's the reality and we know whether that problem was solved or not, um, and so I think that supporting our product teams, our engineering teams, with the infrastructure of continuous integration, continuous deployment, frequent deployment. 
um, you know, that side of the house really brings a huge, tremendous amount of power, and it de-emphasizes the importance of estimation. Um, and many of the teams that I have, we haven't estimated things in a couple of years. We don't do t-shirt sizing. We don't do story pointing. We have a backlog of the most important thing to the least important thing, and we work through it in order. And we look at every week, and we say, you know, what do we think we can get done this week? And, and then on Friday, we measure ourselves and say, well, did we get that done? Next week, when we decide what we're going to take on, you know, so you're still, you're still estimating, but you're not, you're not saying three months from now, we're going we're gonna to have this module completed. Sure. So your, your point is that when you need to prove financial viability of your efforts and you're not going to continue to get funded until you show that, you may not have the luxury of saying, we'll, we'll let you know when we're done. And I agree with that, but, what I, can, but I, I do think that the faster you determine, it, to determine that, the better. So the, 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 the business owners are in a place where they trust you that they'll, you'll get the stuff out, it becomes a non-issue. Yep. There's, <laughs> Right. So there's the notion of minimal, minimum viable products. There's minimum viable amounts of time to prove something out. You know, so you, you do need to get to establish, you know, you need to show evidence and progress as soon as you can. Um, and if you're doing that, th that's, where, that's where I can trust you. If, we, if, if I know that, you know, we all agree on what the short-term goals are and we get to those as quickly as possible, you're, you're developing trust with your leadership and with your customers and with your financing. So um, speed is essential. DevOps helps you be faster. Um, here we go. <laughs> so here, great, great segue. Um, the answer is it's, I, I don't feel, I feel like I've, we've done some things that have worked. We've done some things that haven't worked. Um, uh, you know, th this is just sort of a short list of, of things that we've done uh, on our teams. Um, Rotating so that people aren't, const aren't on, on indefinite call is important. Um, if you take a support call outside of normal business hours, I ask that you, you know, the next day or the next, you know, next week, you, you take, take that time off. Like, I, I don't want people routinely working more than a normal 40-hour week. And, and I include the on-call stuff in that. So, um, so I, I really want people to feel like work at night is the same as work during the day in terms of, actually, it's probably, you probably should even figure out a way to reward them more for, you know, if they spend two hours from midnight to 2 a.m., take the next half day off. I mean, for sure. That's, you know, and, and that's hard too sometimes because they may not have had anything planned. You know, like people want to plan things out. So give them flexibility. Let them know that you respect their time. And if they want to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to take my half day at the end of next Friday so we can go out of town. Like, absolutely. You know, these, these are the most valuable thing you have are your people. Make them feel that way. You know, like, the, like, like the, you want them to have a sense of urgency, but you want them to feel like you respect them as, you know, as your most valuable um, asset, and, which they are. So, um, you know, another thing that's really important, and this is sometimes something you have to establish with the business folks, is... Hey, because just because I'm available all the time doesn't mean you should contact me all the time. And so have very clear channels for communication of what's urgent and what is interesting, but you can deal with it on Monday morning. And that, that's a learning process. And it can be one that um, if a team is really proud of the system they keep up and they, and they are very responsive, if you start bothering them with non-critical things during off hours, you're going to fry them out. And you have to be... You have to set expectations that the only things that get to disrupt my evenings and weekends are actual you know, customer problems or things that are affecting the business. If it's something that can wait until the next morning or Monday morning, we have, we have to have ground rules established about how to do that. Um, and figure out how to not alert people who aren't on call, and whether that is you use a tool like PagerDuty, which is really great about letting you go through different rotations, or whether it's instructing your team to say, hey, if you're not on call, shut off your alerting. You know, take, take alerts off Slack or off HiveChat. And then if you are on call, please you know, so, you know, develop that sense of like when you're not on, you're not on. And you, you don't even hear about the issues if they come up. Um, this is just a short list. I, I definitely don't feel like I have this figured out. I think somebody who's got an operational background probably would be like, yeah, this is kindergarten stuff. Um, 
there's probably there's probably a lot more to this. You know, I'd, I'd throw it out there. Who you know, what are some other sustainable approaches? A quick question. Yeah. This assuming that you have like a first level knock that's looking at problems, or is it you are no. Alerts are going straight to the, the, the alert. Company. Yeah, something something happens. You know, you 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 your your service slows down. Somebody on the team gets notified, and not just the not just the DevOps people. The the Correct. You're, you're, you're interrupting people all the time. Yep. Yeah, a noisy system is one that people ignore, and then you'll either fry them out or they won't take it seriously. So getting, that's a great point, getting very efficient and effective at any time there's alert, it's something actionable, is, is important. That's, and that's not an easy process. It takes, a, it, ex, expect that if you're moving to this model, it's going to seem like chaos for a while, and it's going to, you need to look for evidence that it's coming down, like the number of alerts that are that are firing is coming down over time. Yeah, root 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 cause analysis. Yeah, it, yeah, it's something that I didn't fully appreciate until working in this world. And once you're done, once you're once you you know you're in the you're in the pressure of the moment, things are down. You know, you feel the weight of the world on you. You get it. You get it. You figure it out. You get it fixed, either short term or permanently. But then there's this glorious point afterwards where you come into work the next day and you say like, here's a, here's a huge list of learnings of stuff that we can do to improve. Like, like you know, if, you, if you're looking for ways of improving, there's no better way than to have an incident and come out of it and, and basically get the team together and, and say, what did we learn from this? You know, what do we take from this? And what's now going to be near or at the top of our backlog that we need to put in place so that next weekend, you know, I can I can enjoy the football game. I don't have to get off my couch and go resolve this issue. That's part, usually part of a post mortem process with any, any right. incident of any sort. But really, coming to f figuring out what that root cause is, not the symptoms, not not the third or fourth down the line, but actually what was the beginning of that failure happening. That that's it's a fun technical thing to do, and it's a great way of uh, of getting the team to learn how to be better operationally. Yep. I, there was a there was a blown opportunity to be a good leader in that case is to say is to recognize the human side of being on a call for six hours is not the right time to ask the how do we fix it you know the next day you know a couple of days later you know um, but that that's that that shows an ignorance towards what it what it's like to be in that and this is goes back to if you're a good engineer you've probably been in those situations so you might have more empathy for that um, or you're an engineer and you don't have any empathy at all. Either one. <laughs> uh, well, we um, had some really great discussions in here. I was really happy, pleased with the debate. Um, any any last minute c concepts? I mean, from my standpoint, thanks for letting me share. It's been a you know as usual. These sessions are always great, and I love coming back for them. Um, I you know somebody asked about the slides. I'll send them off to to Mike and you know for people that are interested. There's a bunch of stuff we didn't cover, but. We really got some really interesting things, and uh, you know, if you're not, if you're in DevOps right now, um, you know, you know it's power. If you're not, strongly encourage you to start taking the steps. You know, look at the 12 factors, um, and uh, you know, good luck. Keep keep uh, doing great things in the program. <laughs>